Why Men Need Woman Suffrage by Helen Keller, published October 17, 1913. Many declare that the woman peril is at our door. I have no doubt that it is. Indeed, I suspect that it has already entered most households. Certainly a great number of men are facing it across the breakfast table, and no matter how deaf they pretend to be, they cannot help hearing it talk. Women insist on their divine rights, immutable rights, inalienable rights. These phrases are not so sensible as one might wish. When one comes to think of it, there are no such things as divine, immutable, or inalienable rights. Rights are things we get when we are strong enough to make good our claim to them. Men spent hundreds of years and did much hard fighting to get the rights they now call divine, immutable, and inalienable. Today, women are demanding rights that tomorrow nobody will be foolhardy enough to question. Anyone that reads intelligently knows that some of our old ideas are up a tree and that traditions are scurrying away before the advance of their everlasting enemy, the questioning mind of a new age. It is time to take a good look at human affairs in the light of new conditions and new ideas, and the tradition that man is the natural master of the destiny of the race is one of the first to suffer investigation. The dullest can see that a good many things are wrong with the world. It is old-fashioned running into ruts. We lack intelligent direction and control. We are not getting the most out of our opportunities and advantages. We must make over this scheme of life, and new tools are needed for the work. Perhaps one of the chief reasons for the present chaotic conditions of things is that the world has been trying to get along with only half of itself. Everywhere we see running to waste woman force, that should be utilized in making the world a more decent home for humanity. Let us see how the votes of women will help solve the problem of living wisely and well. When women vote, men will no longer be compelled to guess at their desires and guess wrong. Women will be able to protect themselves from man-made laws that are antagonistic to their interests. Some people like to imagine that man's chivalrous nature will constrain him to act humanely toward women and protect her rights. Some men do protect some women. We demand that all women have the right to protect themselves and relieve man of this feudal responsibility. Political power shapes the affairs of state and determines many of the everyday relations of human beings with one another. The citizen with a vote is master of his own destiny. Women without this power and who do not happen to have natural protectors are at the mercy of man-made laws, and experience shows that these laws are often unjust to them. Legislation made to protect women who have fathers and husbands to care for them does not protect working women whose only defenders are the state's policemen. The wages of women in some states belong to their fathers or their husbands. They cannot hold property. In parts of this enlightened democracy of men, the father is the sole owner of the child. I believe he can even will away the unborn babies. Legislation concerning the age of consent is another proof that the voice of woman is mute in the halls of lawmakers. The regulations affecting laboring women are a proof that men are too busy to protect their natural wards. Economic urgencies have driven women to demand the vote. To a large number of women, is entrusted the vitally important public function of training all childhood. Yet it is frequently impossible for teachers to support themselves decently on their wages. What redress have these overworked, underpaid women without the vote? They count for nothing politically. An organization of women recently wanted to obtain a welfare measure from a legislature in New York. A petition signed by 5,000 women was placed before the chairman of a committee that was to report on the bill. He said it was a good bill and ought to pass. After the women had waited a reasonable time, they sent up a request to know what had become of the bill. The chairman said he did not know anything about it. He was reminded of the petition that had been brought to him signed by 5,000 women. 
Oh, replied the chairman, a petition signed by 5,000 women is not worth the paper it is written on. Get five men to sign and we'll do something about it. That is one reason we demand the vote. We want 5,000 women to count for more than five men. A majority of women that need the vote are wage earners. A tremendous change has taken place in the industrial world since power machines took the place of hand tools. Men and women have been compelled to adjust themselves to a new system of production and distribution. The machine has been used to exploit the labor of both men and women as it was never exploited before. In the terrific struggle for existence that has resulted from this change, women and children suffer even more than men. Indeed, economic pressures drive many women to market their sex. Yet women have nothing to say about conditions under which they live and toil. Helpless, unheeded, they must endure hardships that lead to misery and degradation. They may not lift a hand to defend themselves against cruel, crippling processes that stunt the body and brain and bring on early death or premature old age. Working men suffer from the helplessness of working women. They must compete in the same offices and factories with women who are unable to protect themselves with proper laws. They must compete with women who work in unsanitary rooms called homes, work by dim lamps in the night, rocking a cradle with one foot. It is to the interest of all workers to end this stupid, one-sided, one-power arrangement and have suffrage for all. The laws made by men rule the minds as well as the bodies of women. The man-managed state so conducts its schools that the ideals of women are warped to hideous shapes. Government and schools engender and nourish a militant public opinion that makes war always possible. Man-written history, fiction, and poetry glorify war. Love of country is turned into patriotism, which suggests drums, flags, and young men eager to give their lives to the rulers of the nation. There will continue to be wars so long as our schools make such ideas prevail. Women know the cost of human life in terms of suffering and sacrifice as men can never know it. I believe women would use the ballot to prevent war and to destroy the ideas that make war possible. In spite of an education that has taught them to glorify the military element in their ideals of manhood, they will wake to the realization that he loves his country best who lives for it and serves it faithfully. They will teach children how to honor the heroes of peace above heroes of war. Women are even now more active in working for social legislation and laws affecting the schools, the milk supply, and the quality of food than are the men who have the votes. Fundamentally, woman is a more social being than man. She is concerned with the whole family, while man is more individualistic. Social consciousness is not so strong in him. Many questions can be solved only with the help of women's social experience. Questions of the safety of women in their work, the rights of little children. Yet her peculiar knowledge and abilities are made the basis of arguments against giving women the vote. It is indisputably true that woman is constituted for the purposes of maternity. So is man constituted for the purposes of paternity. But no one seems to think that incapacitates him for citizenship. If there is a fundamental difference between man and woman, far be it from me to deny that it exists. It is all the more reason why her side should be heard. For my part, I should think that man's chivalrous nature would cause him to emancipate the weaker half of the race. Indeed, it seems strange that when he was getting the suffrage for himself, it did not occur to him to divide up with his beloved partner. Looking closer, I almost detect a suspicion of tyranny in his attitude toward her on the suffrage question. And can it be that this tyranny wears the mask of chivalry? Please do not misunderstand me. I am not disparaging chivalry. It is a very fine thing, what there is of it. The trouble is, there is not enough to go around. Nearly all the opportunities, educational and political, that women has acquired 
have been gained by a march of conquest with a skirmish at every post. So since masculine chivalry has failed us, we must hustle a bit and see what we can do for ourselves and the men who need our suffrage. First of all, we must organize. We must make ourselves so aggressive a political factor that our natural protectors can no longer deny us a voice in directing and shaping the laws under which we must live. We shall not see the end of capitalism and the triumph of democracy until men and women work together in the solving of their political, social, and economic problems. I realize that the vote is only one of many weapons in our fight for the freedom of all, but every means is precious and equipped with the vote. Men and women together will hasten the day when the age-long dream of liberty, equality, and brotherhood shall be realized upon earth.